We were on vacation, backpacking through Europe, staying in hostels and trying to make every penny count. When we met Lorenzo, we were in a pub outside of London doing what American college students do best when traveling across the pond, mostly annoying the locals. We were about to get kicked out of yet another pub, the third one since our trip had started when he had approached us. You Americans, you only think you know how to have fun. I show you a better way. Show you things that you will talk about for the rest of your lives. For a price, he said. His thick accent obscuring the insulting nature behind his words and hyping the intrigue of his offer. There were four of us. Marcus, my best friend. Julie, his girlfriend. And Amanda, Julia's best friend. I always had the biggest crush on Amanda ever since we had first met. And me, I'm Franklin, by the way. Four American college students spending the summer in Europe. Making memories and seeing the inside of as many pubs and bars as we could afford. When this young, darkly handsome Italian approached us and offered to show us an unforgettable time, we were all skeptical. We had seen too many movies and knew to be wary about who to trust in a strange new land. Hostile, taken, etc. We were all ready to blow him off until he mentioned Rome. And that was all that it took. Oh my god, I've always wanted to go there. Just think of these centuries worth of history. The brilliant architecture, the sculptures, and the paintings. It's on my bucket list. Oh, please, 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 can we? Amanda pleaded desperately. She seemed to be alone on the decision of wanting to go. So me being smitten by her like I was, I jumped on the bandwagon. Anything that I could do to make her happy, as well as spend more time with her, I was down for it. That's too for and too against. We're deadlocked, it seems. Oh, come on, Marcus. Pretty please. If we all go there, it'll be four of us. There's only one of him, if push comes to shove. Plus, you've got that stun gun, Julie. And Marcus, you know karate. Amanda pleaded with the couple. How much? Marcus asked the stranger, his resolve visibly weakening. You pay for my train ticket and give me 50 euros and we go, I take you. Lorenzo said with his limited use of English. My cousin is priest and I take you to beautiful church and he let us in. Show you things not allowed to the public. He said trying to seal the deal. It worked. As shortly after, we were all in agreement. On the train ride there, we all goofed about and bantered. I couldn't help but notice Lorenzo was suspiciously quiet. I had chalked him up to not having the best grasp of the English language, much less our Americanized version of it. So long as he kept his word, we were sure to have a blast, but... I still kept my eyes on him like a hawk. He had agreed that we wouldn't have to pay him until we had arrived at the church in question. A reasonable stipulation. Even so, I didn't fully trust him. When we had arrived, Lorenzo made a few phone calls speaking Italian the whole time. Marcus standing behind him began mocking him by pressing his fingers and thumb together and flapping his wrists in that classically Italian gesture that they tend to do when talking passionately about something, usually food. I got a chuckle out of this and thankfully Lorenzo hadn't noticed, so engrossed he was with his phone conversation. When he had finally finished his phone call, he bid us to follow him. We passed many gorgeous fountains and ancient temples of worship along the way. Naturally, Amanda wanted to stop at every single one and take it all in though reluctantly couldn't lest we fall behind our guide. We'll have plenty of time to check it all out after our little adventure. This guy is supposed to show us things that aren't usually open to the public, and all the regular sites aren't going anywhere. We'll come back, I promise. Marcus chided her along. I couldn't blame her. The sheer number of beautiful statues, frescoes, and unique architectural marvels that we passed 
couldn't help but catch her eye. This place was like a daunting maze, and around every corner history had been lived and written. We would have to stay here for days to see even a fraction of all that it had to offer. Here we are, my friends, the first church of the Jesuits. Stay right here while I find my uncle. He said and it was off. He left us standing before its amazing paintings in the nave. That's odd, I thought. Didn't he say that we were going to see his cousin? Now he said that it was his uncle, I pointed out. While well, English isn't exactly his first language, maybe he misspoke, Judy said. Look, a man pointed across the large church to where Lorenzo was uh, talking with an older looking man wearing priest garb. He obviously meant uncle, judging by their age difference. Plus the guy looks legit. I seriously doubt that we would be scammed by a man of God. It wouldn't be very Christ-like. We laughed at the tone in which she had added that last bit, drawing the judging eyes of several nearby parishioners deep in prayer. Cousin, uncle, priest, or pope, I don't care. If they try to pull anything over on us, I'll mess them up, Marcus added, receiving a smack on the arm from Julie at his side. Don't say that, we're in God's house, she said after the smack, shooting daggers with her eyes. She always was the adult in the relationship. Back in our first year of college, Marcus and Julie had first met when he was acting an immature fool and Julie called him out on his BS. They've been together ever since, proving that at least in some cases, opposites really do attract. I turned and left their bickering to go and stand next to Amanda, who had wandered a few feet away and was completely engrossed in the majesty of a fresco on the ceiling portraying dozens of souls ascending up into the heavens. A multitude of cherub-like angels and saints above surrounding Jesus waiting to receive them. Golden rays of sunshine bathed their stoic faces as they gazed upward into the torrent of angels above. In contrast, surrounding the perimeter of the painting were a gathering of stucco-sculpted heretics, appearing to be hurled back toward the earth on their dark storm-infested clouds. The whole arrangement, when combined together, had an effect as if the three-dimensional sculptured sinners were pouring forth from the painting, and it was jaw-dropping in its intricacy and grandeur. We stood there in silence absorbing it all in when a voice broke our trance. It's magnificent, isn't it? We both turned around and looked. It was Lorenzo's cousin or uncle, standing behind us and looking upward to the installment that had us so captivated. His hands were folded behind his back in a posture of unthreatening authority. It was designed by Giovanni Battista Gilli, years after the church's completion. You see these sinners around its border. Protestants, or so the church believes. Are, are you Protestants by chance? He asked, though in a non-judgmental tone. No, sir, I was raised Catholic until my mother had passed away. I said, receiving a smile from the older priest. He turned to Amanda, raising a quizzical eyebrow as if to ask, and you. No, oh, non-denominational. She answered his silent query. He merely maintained his friendly smile at her answer, though for just a split second I could swear that I saw a facial twitch. Those were different times, he said gesturing back upward with a glance. These days all are welcome in the Lord's house, the way that it should be. Lorenzo told me that you're students, yes and that you wish to see some of our more private artifacts in the collection. Yes, sir, very much so. Amanda answered, her face beaming with excitement. Oh, please, call me Father, Father Antonio. And it would be my pleasure if you could gather your friends over there and meet me by the ambulatory whenever you're ready, he stated giving a nod before turning and walking away toward one of these side walls deeper within the structure. Oh my god, oh my god, Amanda said giddy. This is going to be amazing, I can already tell. 
She reached out and grabbed me by the hand. Her skin was so soft, I remember thinking at the time how I wanted to hold her hand so badly numerous times since I had met her. My heart skipped a beat. She looked up and into my eyes, sincerity incarnate. Thank you so much, Franklin. I know that you only agreed to do this because I wanted to so badly. I'm not blind. I'm seeing the way that you look at me sometimes when you think I'm not looking. She squeezed my hand tenderly. I've been waiting quite a while for you to make your move, you know. She said, smiling up at me. Her eyes were two hazel pools I wanted to drown in. I, uh, me? I stuttered, completely taken off guard by this sudden turn of events. I mean, what's not to like? You're amazing in every way. I somehow managed to blurt, as if the words were already within my throat waiting to be released. I've wanted to tell you for so long. I continued but was stopped by her putting a silencing finger to my lips, accompanied by the brightest smile that I've ever seen and grace her beautiful lips. We'll talk later. She shushed me with a wink. The butterflies in my gut were flapping and fluttering so hard. It's a miracle that I didn't lift off of the ground and get carried upward into the waiting heavens above, along with the other faithful portrayed in the masterpiece that we had been gazing upon mere moments ago. Still holding hands, we returned to Marcus and Julie, still bickering where we had left them. It's legit. Are you guys ready or do you need more time to argue about who has the bigger ego? Amanda teased playfully. We all knew that would take decades. Marcus swung his arm around Julie. Now we're ready, I was just making a point in winning. This awarded him with Julie's elbow to his ribs. Together, we made our way across the church toward the waiting priest. Marcus leaned back, locking eyes with me behind the girl's shoulders. He looked down at Amanda's head and mine intertwined and then back up at me. In that moment, we used that ability all guys have with other men, holding an entire conversation with nothing more than a few glances and facial expressions. If conveyed with actual words, it would have gone something like, Hey, you finally made your move. Yeah, something like that. Nice bro, about time. No doubt the girls had their own psychically silent conversation, only they were far better at it in every way, and were able to convey infinitely more complex notions and communicate without the need of even eye contact. Such is the advanced nature of the fairer sex. When we arrived in front of the old priest that, we were intercepted by Lorenzo, who merely extended his palm in expectation of payment. He seemed satisfied when the money was placed in his hand, and wordlessly he turned toward the entrance and left. We followed Father Antonio through an intricately carved door that was previously cordoned off by a red velvet robe. I suppose you want the full tour experience. He asked as he led the way, not even glancing over his shoulder at us. Yes, please, Amanda chirped. Well, of course. Construction began in 1568 under the leadership of Pope Pius V, who was granted the duty of Pope two years before. He died sadly before seeing its completion in 1580. Baloney. You're telling me that this place only took 12 years to build, I mean all of this? Marcus asked incredulously. Absolutely. Many of the frescoes and other installations were later additions, mind you. But the actual building itself, only 12 years. It was a testament to the skill of these stonemasons of their time. Sadly, Pope Pius V never saw its completion while, let's say, he was above ground. Astounding, Amanda muttered under her breath while gawking. Would you like to see him? Father Antonio asked, receiving only our confusion as an answer. Like his corpse? I said, not able to discern the man of God's intent. His face was a death mask of seriousness. He merely stood there, staring at us wordlessly for several moments, 
Moments that stretched out to an awkward, if not macabre, eternity. He finally broke the tension with a comical yet warm smile. Of course not, I have a portrait of him in my office. He let out a slight chuckle at our relief. We all let out laughs as well, laughs that were masking in size of relief. You're funny, father. I didn't know if priests were allowed to have a sense of humor, Julie said. When you've been in the church as long as I have, you'll discover that God himself has the ultimate sense of humor, my child. We followed the old man from room to room while he went into historic detail about the many artworks and installations of the church. Many master painters and sculptors attributed to that grand cathedral over the centuries, each one adding to its magnificent grandeur. We were surrounded by beautiful things, though I'll admit. I zoned out a good deal every time we transitioned between rooms. By far the most beautiful thing in the church was still holding my hand, giving subtle and gentle squeezes. Everyone a message, my mind occupied itself in deciphering. What's down there? Marcus asked while we were walking down a particularly ancient looking stone corridor. He pointed through a stone archway which led downward into blackness. That, my son, leads down into the substructure. It's where the church keeps some of our more delicate secrets. Secrets? What kind of secrets? He asked. The kind forbidden to the public. That is all that you need to know. He answered curtly. It was at that moment a younger man wearing a church garb came quickly around the corner in which we had just come. He called out to Father Antonio and hastily walked up to the old priest. He was panting heavily, as if he had been running before turning the corner in his search for the old man. After whispering something into his ear, Father Antonio's posture straightened and his eyes widened as if in alarm. That concludes our tour, I'm afraid. There's a pressing matter that requires my personal attention. I apologize, but I must leave you here. I trust you remember the way back to the nave. He asked, but he was already walking away at a fast pace, making the question a rhetorical one and leaving us standing there unattended. That was odd, Amanda said. I wonder what was up with that. I don't know, but I don't feel like I quite got my money's worth. Marcus stated, already peering toward whatever lay at the bottom of the dark stone stairwell, down toward the forbidden. What do you say, guys? I'm not so sure. I think we call it a day and find a place to hang our hats for the night. I said, I'm not going to lie, I was curious, but my opinion was biased. I was slightly more concerned with leaving so that Amanda and I could be alone. I was thrilled with this turn of events between us and I had so much in my mind that I wanted to pour out to her, in private. I would do just about anything for that woman, which was why whenever she took my hand to follow down those roughly hewn stone steps, I followed. It was dark and lighting the way with the flashlight on his phone, Marcus led the way. After a while, the steps began curving downward, and with the depths, the temperature began dropping. The stone walls glistened with moisture as we descended deeper and deeper. Amanda's hand became sweaty in mine as she began gripping it tighter as we went. I had to hand it to her though, even though she was obviously getting a little perturbed by how deep we were going, she hadn't put it to words. I guess her curiosity outweighed her fear. She was braver than Julie at least, who had begged to turn back several times by the time we finally had reached the bottom. At the bottom was a corridor. It appeared to be cut from the very volcanic rock itself and we all shined our cell phone lights around in the darkness. I couldn't help but feel amazed. I know what this is, Amanda exclaimed, her voice echoing far off into the distance from both sides of the tunnel. These are some of the lost catacombs beneath Rome. Catacombs? Julie whispered loudly as if fearing to reproduce the echo that Amanda's voice had just caused. Like dead people, heck no. She began trying to drag Marcus back up the stairs by the hand, though she hadn't been able to even budge him. Sweet, 
Now this is what I paid for, he said, not even faced by Julie's incessant pulling and attempts at dragging him. It'll be all right, babe, I got you. Just stay close to me if you're scared. She reluctantly gave up, knowing like we all did that once Marcus got it in his mind that he was doing something, there was no easy way of talking him out of it. With her arms drawn in close to her sides, she squished her body against his, reminding me of a shy child hiding behind their mother's skirt. It was like entering a forgotten era, a sepulcher for the dead. There were numerous slots carved into the walls lining both sides of the passage, stacked three high in most places. Luckily, as Amanda called them, fused to that large rectangular slate sheets of rock enclosing the men, though for every one that was still intact, there were dozens that were smashed open, and even more that were non-existent and open to the beams of our lights. Shrouded skeletons occupied them, their shapes beneath the time-worn shroud suggested of the bones belonging to the occupants beneath. I had wrote a paper in the catacombs beneath Paris. While doing research for it, I sourced a good deal on other catacombs around Europe. These loculi were meant for most of the general Christian population. Richer families could afford a cubicula, think of them more like an underground mausoleum or like a little room all to themselves. The more extravagant ones were reserved for bishops and martyrs, even some saints. Those were called Arcosolia. Amanda had explained, obviously enthralled by the subject, and was thus like a kid in a candy shop about where we had ended up. I shined my light down and had an almost unrecognizable shape on the lip inside of one of the loculi. I walked over to get a better look and saw what looked like a little wood carving of a horse. I shined deeper inside of the recess and saw the skeleton of a child no more than ten years old. Many buried their dead with some of their possessions, usually with tools that denoted their occupation in life like this one. She pointed out the one above it. There was a crude hammer lying next to the dusty old bones. He was probably a carpenter, maybe a stonemason. She went on as if she were giving a lecture. We traveled deeper into that monument for the dead. It twisted and turned and we ran into multiple dead ends, each one usually housing a more extravagant and intricately carved alcove, housing a family's worth of skeletons. In the forefront of my mind, I wanted to turn back, and the deeper we went, the stronger that feeling became. I've never been claustrophobic, but the narrowness of some of those hallways were enough to make me reconsider. I'll freely admit the only thing driving me forward was Amanda. I would have followed her to the very center of the earth, despite the dread and fear that was creeping ever so closer and growing to unignorable proportions. I didn't want her to think of me as a coward. I wish that I would have spoken up. I wish I could go back and drag all of us out of that sepulcher of the dead, even if it did hurt my chances with her. We were going ever deeper and though there weren't many twists or turns that didn't stop in dead ends, the path back would be arduous. We had just entered into a large room by far the largest yet. The ceiling had to be at least 30 feet above us. Shining our lights upward, we were greeted with a series of gothic style arches carved in black rock. They looked so out of place with the surrounding rock that they had been placed around the supports. They were carved from what we first to believe to be onyx, though I had never seen onyx so black before. I swear that they absorbed all light, not even casting the reflections of our slowly dwindling lights from our phones. My battery was getting low and we had been down there for so long, all of us using our phone's flashlights to illuminate our way. The others had to be in similar shape. Oh my god, Amanda yelled. We're in some kind of underground cathedral. You see the altar over there. And then I heard it. It was ever so faint, but it sounded like the rustling of heavy linked chains. I pointed it out to the others, but they swore that I was only hearing things. Julie was the only one beside me that agreed when I suggested that we turn back. 
Marcus and Amanda both were having far too good of a time in this pit, surrounded by corpses. I pleaded with them. Their opinions of me did not matter. It was time to go. Now don't be such a baby, Frankie. Just a little bit further and then we'll turn back. Marcus was saying, the whole while Julie was tugging at his sleeve. Marcus, what the heck is that over there? She pleaded, her tone of voice seeping with fright. We all stopped and looked to an alcove beyond the stone altar at the back of the chapel. There was another roughly cut stone doorway behind it that led further into the darkness. The door itself wasn't much different than the dozens that we had already passed through on our underground journey thus far. What made this one stand out from the others were the dark smears all around it. What looked like a bloody handprint stained its edge. Handprints that looked as if they were grasping the edge of the stone. A vain attempt to fight whatever it wanted to drag them deeper into the inky blackness beyond. Holy crap, Marcus whispered, showing the first signs of fear since we had left the world of the living up above. But I think it's time to leave now. I don't think that's an option anymore. A voice boomed into the chamber, followed by the loud slamming of metal on stone. We all had turned toward the source of the voice, back toward the way that we had come in. Our lights illuminated a large iron portcullis, barring the entrance. On the other side stood Father Antonio, a solemn look upon his face. I truly am sorry, my children. Don't think that this doesn't weigh heavily upon me, it always does. He said, a look of disappointment filling his eyes. Hey, what the heck, let us out of here. Marcus yelled, I raid at the servant of God. You're locking us in. Though I wish it didn't have to be this way. The truth is, I trusted you all to leave. I gave you a choice whether you realized it at the time or not. He had stated, sadness seeping into his voice. He looked downward, unable to meet her eyes. They always make the wrong choice. The sound of the chains came, slowly rattling from behind us, unmistakable this time. They came as if following footsteps, approaching slowly and growing louder with every clang. What are you talking about? Come on, father, let us out. We're, we're really sorry, okay? Julie said, pleading as tears walled up in her eyes. No, my child. I'm sorry. What's that noise? What's in that other room? Amanda had asked, probably the calmest out of all of us about how this situation was developing. Father Antonio made the sign of the cross, and he kissed the crucifix that he wore around his neck. There were tears rolling down his cheeks. Do you recall me saying that God has the ultimate sense of humor? He had asked, his voice cracking toward the last. Meet Pope Pius V. Before his tragic death, he was bitten by a creature. A spawn from below. Yo, what are you talking about? Quit messing with us and let us out. Call the police and have us arrested for trespassing. We're sorry, okay? Just let us out of here. Marcus pleaded. It was too late, though. The creature that was once Pius V leader of Christ's kingdom here on earth was upon us. The rest happened so fast. Julie screamed a blood-curdling screech and her phone dropped to the stone, its light illuminating the black pillars above. The sounds of wet crunching silenced her mid-cry. Marcus didn't even have time to yell before he was swatted against the far wall, producing a bone-crushing thwack. It was upon him in an instant. Amanda looking up into my eyes seemed resigned to her fate and chose to spend her last moments on this earth looking up at me. Her hand, grasping mine tightly, spasmed as in an instant she was no longer standing before me. I felt something wet and warm splatter on my face. All I could do was stand there, not even realizing that the spasming grasp of Amanda's severed hand was still in mine. I had loved her, I realized that now. She was made by God for me and I for her. 
I continued to stand there in shock, waiting for the proverbial executioner's axe to drop and end my wretched existence. It never did. I had gone into shock either that or my mind decided to shut down in a vain attempt to protect my sanity. The next thing that I remember, I was sitting across from Father Antonio. We were back in his office and he had been speaking. Spare is the faithful. He was able to sense that about you. You, my child, are special. God has chosen you. Why? It was the only thing that I could muster the strength to say. Not so much inquiring into what he had just said, as much as I was questioning how a loving God could let such a horrible thing happen, could take Amanda from me just as we were beginning our journey into each other's hearts. Why her and not me instead? Why, why, why? I think Father Antonio understood the deeper connotation of my question. Instead of answering with a God works in mysterious ways or any of those cliche platitudes, he merely reached over and took my hand gently like a parent would. We all have a purpose, my child. Even pious down there serves a higher purpose, a reason for his existence. Heaven comes calling and this time it's calling for you. Ours isn't to question his reason. It is to serve his will. And believe me when I say war isn't just coming. It's already upon us. He sat with me all throughout the night and we talked about many things. He divulged to me many dark secrets of the church. Secrets that had been hidden in plain sight throughout its storied past. They used to feed Protestants to that thing, back in the time of Martin Luther's Reformation. Defectors from the church who had attempted to join the dark forces massing in the background, because Pius refuses to kill those chosen by God, and people that God has determined to have a higher purpose. The church uses him as a sort of litmus test. In fact, Every man of the cloth in the Vatican once stood before Pope Pius V, and those that he deemed unworthy were slaughtered. It ensures that all those who attain high rank within the church are chosen by God himself, vetted by a demon. He was God's demon, though. God really does have a sense of humor, I thought, looking up into the portrait of Father Antonio had a Pius V on his office wall. I had so many revelations dropped into my lap that night, life-altering tidbits of knowledge about the true battle between good and evil, the true nature of heaven and the other place and where our universe fits into it. I knew what I had to do. I had lost my friends, my possible future with Amanda. My whole world had been turned upside down, but the enemy of God would do far worse. They wouldn't stop until it was all consumed. Turn to ash in the blink of an eye just to prove a point to God. To them, we were merely cannon fodder. That night, I found my reason for existence. I looked back on it now, not only with sorrow but with purpose. It was the day the veil was lifted from my eyes and I hated what I saw. I saw the truth. By their logic, God chose me. I'd meant for a higher purpose meant to do God's will. I question the sanity of such a god of his twisted intent. The only way that I can rationalize it, any of this, is that he must be suicidal. Because I intend to burn it all down.